What we've seen in this last section, in this simple linear setting, this should have given you a good intuition for how sensitivity analysis works, especially those contour plots. Those are very important tools for sensitivity analysis. And hopefully the short proof that we gave in that linear setting helped give you some understanding for why we end up getting those results. However, it is still a simple linear setting. For example, we might like that t is not a linear function of w and u, and that y is not a linear function of w and u, rather that they could be much more complex functional forms. As this is a frontier of research, and this class is just an introduction to causal inference, we won't go super in-depth onto these different things, but I will highlight a few papers and what marginal value they give us. The first thing is that in our setting, t isn't binary. t was just this function of w and u. It didn't need to be binary at all. But in causal inference, t is often binary. So we might want to consider a setting where the treatment is binary. And that's what Rosenbaum and Rubin considered in 1983 and Imbens in 2003. They consider this setting where the probability of treatment given w and u is a sigmoid function of this linear combination of w and u. And similarly, the y is a bit different in that they have this noise term here. So they have normal distribution noise being added to what we had which is the same as here, if we didn't have the noise. So in the setting that they consider, they have a very simple parametric form for t that we see above, where it's this sigmoid of a linear combination. And they have this simple parametric form for y, where y is a noisy linear function of w, u, and t, almost the same as what we considered in our example. And in those papers, u must be binary, and you must be a scalar. You can't have more than one unobserved confounder. So these papers really aren't that general. It's just that they have a binary treatment setting. And I want to contrast them with, for example, this recent paper by Sinelli and Haslett, where they drop many of these assumptions. So for example, they don't need to have a simple parametric form for T. They don't assume anything about the parametric form for T. Similarly with, with you, you can be whatever. And they even allow you to be more than one confounder. And we'll now give a bit more information about this paper in this slide. They assume no parametric form for the structural equation for t. Also, their approach allows for multiple confounders. In other words, u can be a vector. And they don't assume that u conforms to any specific distribution. And very importantly, they give rigorous bounds to tell us when we can know that our causal effect estimate is sufficiently robust to unobserved confounding. So if you think back to when I showed you those contour plots and I said, okay, we got an estimate of 25 and say we care about our estimate being positive, then we want to know how much unobserved confounding we can tolerate without that unobserved confounding biasing our estimate so much that it changes the sign of it. So it would be nice to know if this robustness is true based on some observed covariates. Maybe we can use that information to reason about unobserved covariates, how u is associated with t and y. And that's something that Sinelli and Haslett refer to as informal benchmarking here. So if they have this unadjusted estimate here, where if you're a zero confounding, then you fall on these axes, and this unadjusted estimate is 0 0.5, and you don't want it to be crossing this red dotted line, which corresponds to 0, right? You don't want it to flip signs. Then you might try to estimate the association of some observed covariate with t and the association of the observed covariate with y, and then plot it on the contour plot. So an informal benchmark might give you a point like that. That's where you just take some observed covariate and get its partial r squared in this case, which you can read more about in the paper. You get its partial r squared with the treatment on the x-axis and the partial r squared with the outcome on the y-axis. 
Anyway, this is a common practice that Imbins introduced in 2003, and many follow-up papers follow this style. But it turns out that you actually need to take into account the unobserved confounders when you're looking at the partial R-squared of some covariate with treatment. And similarly for the partial R-squared of some covariate with outcome. You have to take into account the unobserved confounders. But you can't do that because they're unobserved. So not taking into account the unobserved confounders is what they refer to as this informal benchmarking, which is what Immens 2003 does and many follow-ups do. And in their paper, Snell and Haslett show that, for example, this informal benchmarking is misleading because really the proper, more formal result would give a bound of zero, which is saying that this estimate is not robust. It's not robust if you have an unobserved confounder that's similar to this observed covariate, that the informal benchmarking would make you think it is robust to because it's way below this red dashed line. Anyway, so in their paper, they make this argument, but then they also come up with bounds so that you can formally know whether your estimate is robust to unobserved confounding under some reasonable assumptions about the unobserved confounding that you have to specify. So, you can go ahead and check out their paper for more information about all of this. This is figure four of their paper. And I'll highlight one more paper. The main theme of these is just that they allow for much more flexible functional forms of the structural equations for treatment and outcome. The last one didn't put any restrictions on the functional form for treatment. And similarly, in this paper, they give us those nice sensitivity curves, but they don't need to be assuming linear outcome and linear treatment. Rather, it can be a much more flexible parameterization. More specifically, they allow for the treatment mechanism and the outcome mechanism to be modeled with arbitrary machine learning models. Right, so this is much like many of the estimators that we saw, where you can plug in any statistical model, any machine learning model, into those estimators to get some model-assisted estimator. And that's kind of what they do in this paper, but for sensitivity analysis. So it's really cool because even with really complex machine learning models, they can still get a closed form expression for the bias, assuming that the models are well specified. This is something that you couldn't even get in that setting that Rosenbaum and Rubin, 1983, and then Imbens, 2003, considered. We saw that a few slides ago. In their setting, they couldn't even get a closed form expression for bias, where they were in a really simple setting, where the treatment was a sigmoid function of a linear combination of W and U, and the Y was a noisy linear function of W and U. But in this paper, they're able to get a closed form expression for the bias when the functional forms are whatever, you know, just kind of crazy machine learning models. So go ahead and check out that paper if you're interested in that. And it's important to note that there are tons of different sensitivity analysis methods. I've just picked out a few here, but it's really kind of a frontier of research. And here are some useful papers. The first one is a review sort of paper. In the second point, we see Rosenbaum. Rosenbaum is a key figure in sensitivity analysis. We didn't see his work, but it easily could have shown up in the course. And then these are some other more flexible sensitivity analyses. So that was kind of the focus of this towards more general settings section, is that we wanted more flexible functional forms, you know, potentially not making assumptions about the functional form at all. But you're always going to kind of have to constrain how the unobserved confounding is happening in some way. So, in other words, you, you always have to make assumptions somewhere when you're doing sensitivity analysis. Great, so that concludes this lecture in the Introduction to Causal Inference online course. Don't forget to smash that like button and hit the subscribe button and bell below if you want to get notifications for any upcoming lectures. And I hope to see you in the next one.